signaling her how much time she had left. Oh, there's Tim Connor. Let's see, it says here that he's been a state court judge since 1991. Is that true? <laughs> that he currently serves as the presiding judge of the probate division of the trial court. And he grew up in the wilds of North Dakota? No, family in South Dakota. South Dakota. <laughs> this, we talked about this a long time ago, so I'm it's training to remember South Dakota. And so he had an opportunity to experience more than one culture because you know there are a lot of First Nations people in South Dakota. And um, that influenced his thinking. You know, I sometimes wish for everybody that we could have an experience that would take us outside of our culture of nurture, the culture with which we are familiar, the culture with which we are numb to its not necessarily normality. You know, we tend to think that what we do is just the way it is. But I wish everybody would have an experience to jolt them out of that. So this year, um, and for about a year remaining, uh, Judge Connor's court has received a grant through the Michigan uh, Supreme Court to initiate a, um, are you calling it a peace court? That's the, the, I know Susan in a video says that you were struggling with that title. But Susan Butterwick is back there, she's, she's also involved. Um, so anyway, to initiate a peace court here in the county, and um, I've been fortunate to participate in that as one of the trainers. I trained the group of mediators in the use of storytelling. Um, and I don't want to step on too much of Judge Connor's time here, but uh, there is one thing I did want to mention, and that is that in 2002, Judge Connors, who was, who was uh, a judge at that point, was inducted into the Ann Arbor Huron High School Hall of Fame. I, I have a page of achievements on this guy, um, but I thought that's the most important thing. That's the end of their Hall of Fame as a distinguished graduate. So, thank you, Judge Connor. responsibilities individually and collectively to put it back on a good path. I mean, that's just the bottom line. And then the question just becomes, well, how do we do this? The, uh, you know, it's so hard, it's just so hard to, to like this. But I know some of you, I don't know most of you. Everybody said, well, give it to me in a nutshell. No, give me, give me a quick thing. Give me a, Read the digest for each, so I'll try. <laughs> the peacemaking court is an attempt to institutionalize in our way of thinking in the justice system an alternative to the way we deal with almost every case. Our current system really emphasizes negative human behavior and then punishes it. So when we look at negative, and we throw more negative on it. 
peacemaking core is to say there's always within that positive human behavior. And so we should have the emphasis on the affirmation of the positive behavior. I'd like to give you two concepts that I think are in the law all the time. That which is sacred, that which is profane. Sacred and profane. I was really attracted, I've heard this before from Belinda when she talks about being drawn to this and seeing the part of our country, part of our city, part of our country at a time, and the chaos. Uh, unfortunately, I think our current structure needs to stay in place because we do have individuals, for whatever reason, are so imbalanced they are addicted to chaos. And they will put that forward in any arena that they can, and it can cause great destruction. But I also believe that each human being, and I believe this to my heart, is born with the sacred, is born with the inherent sense that we are connected, is born with the idea that they want to get along, is born with the idea that we are one, is born in love. I believe that. And what's happened is we make it very easy in our society to talk about things like revenge, greed, anger, cynicism, all these negative things, you know? And it's who can be more righteous in their indignation? Who can be more righteous in their cynicism? Who can be more righteous in their anger? Who has the right to greater revenge? And when people talk about things like love and compassion, everyone starts looking over their shoulder. <coughs> so we focus on the profane and we are afraid to articulate and affirm the sacred. I believe that. We are very lucky in this country because we have two populations who have survived a way of thinking towards them that was profane. And in their survival, they carried within their culture the survival of that which is sacred. Those two populations, of course, are our African American population and our Native American population. And when I talk about profanity in the law, when we have justified as an institution which colonized the idea that land or property has more value than another human being. And thus, our laws start to justify that we can look at our fellow human being as property, or we can label our fellow human being as a savage and inconvenient entity who already is here. We have followed down the path of prevention. Those roots are in our laws. They're still there today. The way that we apply as a governmental policy to Native Americans still has its roots, the justifications, the Supreme Court decisions that still labels people as savages and animals. Those cases have not been overturned in their fundamental thinking. So I believe that the task at hand is to create this space. Ron hit it right on the head. We need to create a space where the sacred is looked at <coughs> as the preferred way of responding to human discord and that it is institutionalized as a concurrent approach. That's what we're I don't, um, truly, 
I don't truly have a doubt in my heart that we can do it. I don't. Because I just think it needs to be done. And I'm thankful that I live in a community where we started here. So, affirmation of positive activity is a value. The Native American peacemaking model came to us, again, as a result of survival. It has been here long before any of most of our ancestors, or any of our ancestors, unless they have Native Americans. I don't describe any. I know. But it has been there a long time ago. And in the early 90s, those populations had been allowed to go back and have their own courts. So it had been formally recognized as a possibility. In Michigan, we have 12 federally recognized tribes, 12 separate tribal courts, each with the degree of sovereignty that they're allowed. And there is a tribal judge by the name of Michael Kinoski, who grew up as a member of one of our northern tribes, served in Vietnam, went to medical school in New Mexico, met Navajos there, went to the Navajo reservation and learned about peace movement. Brought it here, started in our tribal courts 20 years ago here, and is now helping us in the state court. Um, how many of you know the story of the two wolves? Two wolves. Two wolves. So it's the idea, this is sort of a central story to this decision of what we do in these movements. The story is simple. The grandchild is upset because a friend has said some untruths about it. Bye. And the uh, very angry that his friend would betray him that way and say something that wasn't true. He goes and talks to his grandfather. He says, I want revenge. This is unfair. The grandfather says, well, we have these two wolves inside each of us. One always wants revenge. One is anger. One is greed. One goes back. And the other says, too bad. We must have been in a bad place. But I'm still living. I'm still OK. We'll keep moving on. And we fight when we have to. We have to fight. We live in our love connection. The grandchild says, well, which wolf wins inside? The one we feed. We've got to feed this other. Um, we have this grant. It is institutionalized. It is my goal that at the end of the year that we demonstrate saying this has value, it should stay, and it should grow. The types of cases that we've handled and I want to talk about in the medicine world, we talk about the emphasis on four things. The first one, the key word, is relationship. The acceptance and the knowledge and the wisdom and the understanding that we are all connected. And I just think about it, we all held our breath right now, pretty soon we're gone. We're on the same umbilical cord together, you know. And so what we do does have this ripple effect, and it is like what you're doing to restore your justice and that understanding. The second is responsibility. The notion that we have the responsibility within ourselves behave in a way that respects that and helps that, but then also collectively we have responsibility to get things back on track. It was interesting for us, Ron was one of our trainers, but this Judge Petoskey was our trainer, talked about in his own native community. He was saying, oh yeah, well you know this sounds like a lot of kumbaya, gonna get tough on these kids in this group, gonna get tough on people, etc." And it actually really is harder, much harder than the window was saying. A lot easier just to come in and shrug and say, okay, give me my punishment, I'm out of here. Much harder to be honest. Honest within ourselves and honest with each other. And then to make amends. And then to forgive. And then to forgive. So relationships, responsibility, the third is respect. When we talk about respect, it's not only the respect that we show towards each other, but it's a deep and profound respect to understanding that none of us have the answers. None of us really don't. Collectively, we begin to understand truth. And even when somebody is behaving badly, we have to respect that inner spirit inside of them. 
in a four to three direction to bring it back. Now in our state court systems, because of the separation of church and state, we cannot talk about things like spirit. It's forbidden. It's actually very interesting because we even talk about objectivity by stepping back and not caring. So in the Native American wheel, the four directions, those four concepts, there's also the idea that part of the balance that we have to carry within ourselves towards each other as a community is body, the heart, the mind, and the spirit. And they're all part of what we are all connected to. So that umbilical cord that we're connected to is all those factors. My very dear friend is waving his hand, and I don't know if it's because he misses me. So you can see I can't possibly start. I can't even start to talk about that 12 minutes. I apologize to you. I just don't have a way of. It's just not peacemaking in a box, you know? It's just not something for my pocket. You've done beautifully. Somebody who's been charged with a crime 
get themselves into, you know, opt for that. Um, and one more thing about that. Would it be possible for someone who has a public defender, could an indigent person actually end up in your court um, in, our, in the system that we've, we've currently got? So we have a, a few questions there. Sorry. In terms of limitations, the only limitation is that everybody has to agree to it. And, and we have to we have to have a feeling that they're there in a good way, as opposed to this is just another theater to cause discord. So it can be any organizations, any individuals, any groups. So it's not limited by the type of case in that regard. Um, where we think it has the most value, obviously, is where there's ongoing relationships. Where it, it has been applied to date successfully is in probate court, where there have been disputes once someone dies or a disabled individual, either because of uh, you know, cognitive development or aging. It's worked very successfully in domestic relations, parenting time issues and custody issues. It's worked actually successfully in an extremely expensive and complicated civil wrongful death case, plane crash in Mexico, serviced in Detroit, built in Texas, two people, families, you know, lost their families. Um, I, of course, my per we're already using it somewhat in juvenile, and it's my real desire that that is an arena that we use it tremendous, a tremendous amount. And I actually think over time it's really the way we start rethinking our whole criminal justice system, which needs a huge overhaul. I am speaking to myself.
successfully in Native communities because many of the Native children were the victims of sexual abuse in boarding schools. Um, also, the incidence of violence among Native women is highest in the country, just among any numbers. So I know that, I, I, I can give you articles, in fact, I just had one sent, but the, my friends that are doing it, this is one of the areas that they go. So I know it has application. I just have to get our current system to accept that we can try that in some cases. It does work, really, but there's no question. What's the hope for other schools doing what you're doing? Uh, well, the hope for other schools is that they would do it. <laughs> but I mean, is that coming to start people talking about it? People are beginning to talk about it. I think in the last 18 months or so, I've had more conversation of, uh, about this than I have in all the five years that we've been studying it. Um, so I'm hoping to uh, get other schools on board with it in some way. Uh, follow up on that a little. Um, there was a special on PBS um, this year mm -hmm. on restorative justice. And have you, do you know where, how to get a link to that for people that want to explore a little bit more? I probably saw that same, I, I watch PBS a lot, so I probably saw that same one. But you can actually go on YouTube. Uh, if you YouTube restorative practices, I know there are schools in Baltimore. Um, the most recent YouTube video I saw was out of, out of a Colorado school district where they have been using the uh, restorative practices maybe for three to five years and are actually seeing a huge reduction in suspensions. Like um, I used the principal saying I used to suspend up to 500. Uh, have 500 days of suspension a year, and now I'm less than 50. Uh, so you can YouTube it and, and see some things. It's happening all over the country, um, which is very, of course, very encouraging for us, but it's been happening for a while. Actually, I, I don't have a question. Um, what I'd like to do is thank Belinda and the Dispute Resolution Center. We're working with her um, in a program at HC Community Schools, and I can see the difference that um, the, the restorative practices is making the um, new approach. And for, in, in, in getting ready for this, um, Michelle Rose Armstrong at High School in Detroit, and they're using the short practices there. They have in one building three high schools, sort of like uh, Gypsy Community School does. Two um, are using the short practices and have been for about three years. One is not, and the two schools are you know, in the building. But they're using the short practices. The suspension of fights and discipline you know, issues that were down. I was very impressed when I went there. The school was quiet and orderly and clean. And I was just, it, it really impressed me. And, um, but again, I'd like to thank the Kathy, see what is it?
we're hoping the restorative practices is, is I think is working. Um, and it was a pleasure to work, of course, with Peely and and Street Resolution Center, because we're all on the same page. And the volunteers that we're using, by the way, are trained in restorative practices and not just people that are um, you know winning it. And I think it really makes a difference for us all being on the same page. Thank you. So thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Joe, for asking. So, um, and let's get some applause, please, for our speaker. I'm going to bring the stuff back up here. A few announcements, and in closing, we are a little over now. <laughs> or a little over. <laughs> So, thank you all. Thank you all. Um, first thing I want to thank again, uh, Linda Doolin, Judge Connors, as Kathy and I was talking about. The, when, when I was hearing what Judge Connors was saying, when it, Kathy was talking about the work that the Sheriff's Office is doing, he reminded me that who we have in these elected positions is really important. There are a couple of open seats in, on the bench that are coming up this year. They don't get a lot of attention in the press, so please follow those races and make sure that we are electing people who have that, who have leadership on these issues of restoration uh, and equity and inclusion. Uh, Judge Connors, in his remarks, said that so much of the truth is in what is not said. And that when I was going through the year, there were a couple of things I didn't say. <laughs> Um, one of those things was about the work that our Racial Economic Justice Task Force has done on the Stand Your Ground legislation. Uh, many of you remember the role that that played in the Trayvon Martin case, and Michigan has a law that has many similarities to the one in Florida. Uh, we've worked with community partners to get resolutions at the County Board of Commissioners, the City Council, to call on the state to change that law. And on May 17th at 9 o'clock at Brown Chapel, there will be a statewide organizing meeting to try to build that momentum. Uh, Senator Rebecca Warren is introducing legislation. She's going to need a lot of help to get that passed. And so this is an opportunity to help move that conversation forward. So if you would like to be part of that effort, again, May 17th at 9 a.m. at Brown Chapel, there will be breakfast there, we'll have some food for you there for lunch. You can please be part of that. Um, the other thing that was left unsaid in my remarks, as I mentioned, the um, Ripples of Hope events, the fundraising breakfast we had last year, we've got another one coming up on May 15th. Um, we will have people at the door as you head out with cards and information about that, but please, it's a wonderful chance to, again, get a little bit of what we're doing and help carry the work forward. Uh, with that, I want to thank you all again for coming. I want you to I want to thank you for being part of the work that Interfaith Council for Peace and Justice is doing to help have, to help transform our community. And as you leave tonight, I hope we can all walk out in peace, walk out in community, and walk out for restoration. And the election be the candidates candidate slated for so you try to have this nice Benediction, but everything else keeps coming up. That's fun. So the auction, the nominated candidates were elected to the board and to the uh, to the president. As Deb's saying, that was close. But thank you for uh, thank you for the auction. Thank you for the great people who are willing to share their resources. If you want to sign the petition on the minimum wage, wage Jeff Harold has copies there. Uh, thank you also to the people who shared the victim of better conferencing play. Play. Thank you to First Unitarian Universalists for hosting us tonight. Thank you again for sharing your evening.